Thanks for being here. My name is Taylor White, and I'm the Director of Post-Secondary Pathways for Youth here at New America's Center on Education and Labor. Our work focuses on strategies and policies that have the potential to restore the link between education and economic mobility by strengthening the institutions necessary to connect them. Well-designed pathways models mm -hmm. by building structured, supported bridges between high schools, colleges, and universities in the nation's labor market can be a high potential strategy for doing exactly that. So we are thrilled to be a part of the launch initiative to advance pathway strategies and to learn alongside a dynamic group of partners from across the U.S. over the coming months. But today, we're excited to host this discussion on the future of college and career pathways on behalf of the launch partners. So we're grateful for the opportunity to host. Uh, and I'd like to just quickly thank our audience and speakers and the fellow launch partners for giving us this chance to do so. Uh, so our time today together is limited, and there's a lot to cover. So I'm not going to delay things any further by extending my welcome. Um, instead, I'd like to kick this over to one of our partners in crime on this initiative, Matt Gandel, who's the CEO of Education Strategy Group, who will share more about the launch initiative before we dive into today's panels. Matt, over to you. Thanks so much, Taylor, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Again, I'm Matt Gandel. I'm president and CEO of Education Strategy Group. We work across the U.S. in states and in communities to help improve the education system, both K-12 and higher ed, so it serves as an engine of economic opportunity and mobility. I'm thrilled that we have nearly 2,000 other leaders from around the country tuned in today for this important conversation. Leaders from K-12, from higher education, employers, workforce boards, elected officials, nonprofits, really appreciate that you're taking the time to join us. Today you're gonna hear, as Taylor mentioned, about a brand new initiative called Launch, and ESG and New America have teamed up with several other national groups, Advanced CTE, Excel and Ed, Jobs for the Future. You'll be hearing from some of them today. Collectively, we hope to dramatically expand quality education to career pathways across the United States. Our five organizations have well over a decade of experience working in all 50 states to build more rigorous and relevant pathways for students so they emerge much better prepared for careers and for life. But we've joined forces in this initiative because we think we're at a critical juncture in the US. Coming out of the pandemic, the bar has been raised for what young people need to be successful in the real world, and our systems need to work hard to, keep, to catch up. Hiring's at an all-time high, what's needed? for today's success in today's economy? What skills, what experiences will open the doors to well-paying jobs in high growth fields? How to re redesign the high school and the college experience to elevate these educational pathways? These are the questions we wanna grapple with today. We've got a packed agenda, lots of great conversation. In a few minutes, we'll hear from a governor and a speaker of the house in two of the participating states to hear how this work aligns with their education and economic priorities. After that, we'll hear from leaders from the higher education, K-12, and workforce systems in other states, those who are doing the work on the ground. But before we dive into those conversations, I want to tell you a little bit more about the launch initiative. In 1983, back when A Nation at Risk was released, the vast majority of jobs could be obtained with a high school diploma or less. Today, that script has been flipped. The vast majority of jobs today require education or training beyond high school, and we expect that, continue, that trend to continue into the next decade. But despite the importance of post-secondary credentials, we've seen severe and ongoing drops in post-secondary enrollment due to the pandemic. Today, nationwide, there's a 7.5% decrease overall in higher education enrollment, and those drops have been seen across racial groups, and we know the community college sector has been hit the hardest. Compounding this challenge, the pandemic has also set our elementary and middle school students back, and they're entering high school less well prepared. Just this past fall, the National Assessment for Educational Progress released the first scores showing what happened during the pandemic in K-12 education, and both reading and math scores in eighth grade declined significantly in nearly every state. So at the very moment that the economy is expecting young people to continue their education past high school, more are coming in further behind. Ultimately, learners want to know that they're on a path 
to long-term success, to economic stability and mobility. And we know that education, especially higher education, is a major investment of their time and their money. And they're beginning to ask questions about the return on that investment. The good news is when students have the support they need to connect their education to their career options, they're much more likely to feel that the investment was worth it. Speaking of investment, over the last several years, there have been major investments by the federal government and also by states in schools and in communities to try to help with recovery. Billions in federal stimulus dollars went to K-12 schools and to higher education, and more resources are being made available to communities to try to help re rebuild infrastructure. How can we ensure these resources aren't simply used to backfill budgets and keep doing business as usual when it comes to our schools? How do we make sure they're directed to programs and strategies that will make a real difference and lasting changes in students' lives after they leave school? Now, this is not something any of our organizations could do alone. That's why we banded together and locked arms in this initiative. We're also very pleased that a number of the nation's largest education foundations have also joined this effort with us, the Walton Family Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Joyce Foundation, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and more. All of these foundations, all of the national partners have realized we have to get out of our organizational silos and build a collective action agenda to drive change. Our vision, it's bold, but simple. Every young person gets to adulthood able to fully engage in a meaningful family sustaining career because their education has exposed them to career possibilities early, has helped them make smarter choices, and has armed them with the skills and experiences to pursue their interests. If we do this right, we think we'll both help the individuals and we'll also help the communities in which they live, ensuring both are economically competitive. We're really excited that we have some leading states and communities joining us in this work. 11 states are part of LAUNCH, and these are states that have put policies in place already, have funding dedicated and reforms underway to dramatically expand student pathways. Our job is to help them scale and accelerate this work together. And within these states, over 20 regions have been selected as implementation sites, urban, suburban and rural regions so that we can show that doing this right will help young people no matter where they live across the United States. We have cross-sector partnerships in each state made up of K-12 higher education, employer and workforce and legislative leaders because none of us can get this done alone. And the initiative is organized into two cohorts, an impact cohort that's driving to achieve greater scale and acceleration in their work and an innovation cohort that's looking around the quarter and trying to build break the mold models to take us to where we need to go in this country. Across all these states and these sites, there's a significant focus on equity because even in the places that have done the most work to date to expand these pathways for young people, we still see differences in student outcomes by race and socioeconomic status. So LAUNCH will focus on identifying, interrogating, and solving these systemic challenges to equity. Success will be measured not only by the number of pathways that get developed, but, but also whether they're ultimately accessible to and taken advantage of by a diverse range of students. These are national challenges, to be sure, but we believe that the solutions will come from these states and these communities participating in this initiative, and we're committed to supporting the work they do they'll be doing to drive change on the ground. We also fully expect the best ideas will bubble up, will be embraced and adapted by others. So we're building a strong network and a learning community to allow that cross-pollinization to take place. By banding together at the national level, states and localities, K-12, higher education, workforce, we believe that collective action will help us accelerate the growth and scale of educational pathways all across the United States. Now it's time to hear from the leaders who are doing the work. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Quentin Sufrin, who's our partner at Excel and Ed, to hear from the governor and the Speaker of the House.
Um, we're excited today to have two distinguished panelists who are also champions of high quality college and career pathways and who are tackling some of these challenges head on in their states. Uh, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Daniel McKee, Governor of the state of Rhode Island, and also the Honorable uh, Todd Houston, Speaker of the Indiana House of Representatives. Governor, Speaker, welcome and thank you for joining us. Well, thank so, you for having me. Yes, as I noted, uh, both of your states are leaders in college and career pathways, uh, and these stem from efforts that have gone on for a number of years, but continue to grow and thrive under your leadership. So let's start with each of your states and, and why you've made such a strong commitment to high quality and equitable pathways. So how do the college and career pathways fit into each of your state's economic and workforce development priorities? Governor McKee, we'll start with you. Well, first, thanks for the uh, invite to be here and, and listen in on, on these really groundbreaking strategies that uh, the launch is putting forward here and the things that Matt just presented. We're, we're fully aligned uh, with these issues. As governor, we've set a high um, priority on, on uh, learning outcomes, increasing learning outcomes so that we're competitive with the very best in the country. And uh, Massachusetts is right next to us. Who's done very, a really strong job there. So we're setting our sights on meeting or exceeding that those go, those reading and math skills by 2030, which is certainly helping on the pathway to higher ed. And been very fortunate to have uh, a commissioner of higher ed in our state, Commissioner Shannon Gilkey, along with our K through 12 commissioner uh, Ifante Green, uh, working with me to kind of align on these issues. But yes, we have been at it for a while, and certainly job training. Uh, into the so that we're preparing students to get into a, a path that they can choose right because we want we want to see our students achieve their potential uh, whatever that might be and so that they can choose their path on whatever that might be right in terms of whether it's a four-year degree or and what what discipline it's in or a two-year degree or an associate's degree or some sort of a path into the military wherever it might be we want them to be prepared uh to uh ultimately find themselves in a spot where achieving one of our main goals is raising income and families in the state of Rhode Island. So we're very much aligned and looking forward to continuing to work um, with this core group. And, and then as we go on our conversation, I'll be happy to share some of the some of the things that I believe are going to really help Rhode Island, uh, might help other states, but, I, but we're well on our way to uh, create a strategy that's going to move us from 180 day learning experience to a 365 learning learning day learning experience on an annual basis that I'd love to get more in detail with you as this conversation goes on. Great. Thank you so much. Speaker Houston, over to you. Well again, thanks for thanks for having me and, and thanks for partnering with Indiana. Um, much like the governor, I think we we all uh, understand the incredible importance of this. I think it is the strategy, frankly. Uh, Career Pathways is the strategy uh, when when we think about uh, addressing workforce and economic development issues. You know, we are 100% uh, committed. You know, we, we you know you hear loud and clear from parents and students they want a relevant education. They, they you know we know we've got to do a better job of the blocking and tackling around math and and, and reading and, and the core subject areas. But as they grow through the system, they want to know what's relevant. They want to know that it has an outcome that's going to be meaning for them, meaningful for them. And so that's why career pathways is so critical. And uh, you know we're, we're trying to remove as many barriers as possible to supporting uh, the pathways to make sure kids get exposure uh, to the to the types of jobs and experiences that, that they might be interested in. As the governor says, we don't want to pigeonhole anybody uh, into something they don't want to do. We want to give them as many experiences as possible, connect them to employers. It has to be an employer-led you know, -led system. And, and what I love about Career Pathways is, man, they, you can easily see the results, right? So you can hold people accountable. To, are we getting certificates in, 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 in areas of, of high demand jobs? Are we, are we getting the outcomes that we need that are relevant to, to improving our workforce and creating a type of economic development that that fits our employers needs, both our current employers and employers are interested in our state. So, you know, we're super excited to partner with all of you on this work. Uh, we think it is absolutely critical uh, to, the, to the long term success of, of Indiana, but most importantly, we think it's critical to, to the kids that we serve. All right, thank you. 
Uh, Matt alluded to it earlier, and, and uh, Speaker Houston, you just mentioned, you know, this idea of barriers to providing high quality pathways. Um, Governor, what, what do you see as some of the biggest barriers to scaling high quality career pathways that are equitable and accessible to all? And how are how is your state addressing some of those barriers? Well, I believe that uh, in my past life, I've been in small business, I've been a mayor, I've been a lieutenant governor, now governor, uh, very involved in boys club work uh, as a member, as a board member, president, started the endowment fund, coached all those kids over, over periods of time. And it's very clear, and, and, it, and, and you don't even need data if you actually have the personal experience that certain families, certain young people have more hurdles to jump than others to get to the finish line. So I think that that's a, an absolute prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic has put us in a spot where, you know, we're talking about three to five year, just academic recovery to get to pre-pandemic levels. We know that that's, a, that's certainly a challenge, Quentin, that, uh, that we never thought we would face. Uh, but we do face that. And so my thought on the issue is that it, we need to be reaching every family, every kid, uh, you know, every student, uh, whether they're in a public school, a private school, a charter school. Uh, we, I helped start what's called mayoral academies in our state that are really work uh, very strongly uh, to close learning gaps. And, and historically, over the last nine, 10 years, 12 years, we've done some significant work in that area. So you're right on target. Uh, in my experience, at least uh, Rhode Island, but I think it, I think it, uh, you know, carries over into all the states in the country. There are certain uh, families or certain students uh, that have more hurdles to jump than others to get to the finish line. And our strategy in Rhode Island is to make sure that we are working with every family, and not slowing anybody down to get towards that finish line or in that first step of the process, whether it's into a career path as we're talking about today. But we want to accelerate uh, those, take down hurdles, lower hurdles uh, for those that are impacted in a in a way that uh, they're disadvantaged for you know no other reason than their economic circumstances and and historically uh, underserved type of populations. We want to move them forward rapidly, but we also want to move uh, other families uh, in a way that they're not their progress is not impeded. But the uh, the pandemic clearly has compounded issues that pre-existed. Uh, and I think, again, you being aware of that on a national level, being a resource for us here in Rhode Island, uh, and the work that I'm doing right now over the last six months preparing to do a, my own launch, our own launch of a strategy to take us from 180-day learning experience to a 365-day learning experience, uh, that's going to allow us to get into every home through municipal leadership, by the way, which as a former mayor, that we can actually talk to families every day about making education a priority in the household as one of the top priorities on a daily basis. Thank you for that. And we we at Launch will be looking for your launch uh, as well. So uh, excited to hear about that. Uh, Speaker Houston, I, I know you're deep in legislative session right now. Um, and this is a topic that, with, that we've discussed before. But what are some of the obstacles that you feel like uh, learners in Indiana are facing now sure. to to accessing or succeeding in a high quality uh, career pathway. And uh, what's Indiana doing about it? So ironically, you know, you wouldn't think this would be your problem, but employers are one significant uh, problem because we need more employers to step up. You know, if you if you walk into my office and you get on the conversation of uh, workforce or uh, economic development, it's the first question I'm going to ask the employers. What are you doing to, to, to make yourself attractive to, to, to young people? You know, we talk a lot about high school kids, 14, 18, but how are you, how are you making sure kids, particularly kids that, that don't uh, have a visibility in the types of careers that, that, that maybe that company is offering? How are you partnering with us? And, and most importantly, with your local community, with your schools to do it. So, Quinn, I think that is a, a key. And, and you know, uh, Governor Holcomb, myself, uh, you know, you, you don't get out of a meeting in which you don't, you know, we're not going to put the, the uh, responsibility back on, you know, we're not your HR department. We need to prepare, you know, we need to prepare kids. But the employer has an important role to play in giving these kids these types of opportunities and exposure. I think the second thing is, is you know, the biggest barrier is, it's just we have a whole bunch of systems already in place, and and those systems are uh, 
you know, they, 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 they've been around for a while is how we're used to doing things. And, you know, we're just trying to disrupt the system and disrupting it by beginning with a coalition of the willing, right? People that see it, kids that are interested, uh, school districts that are trying to do new things, not, you know, trying to build from the, the capacity of, of, of what we have uh, and encouraging others to, to, to come along with us. But, you know, it, it's tough to get people to think about, you know, what's work-based learning look like? You know, how's that replace a traditional math or, or science course? How do you make sure it's relevant? And how do you make sure, you know, it has the type of rigor that we would expect? So, you know, all these things can be barriers. I think they're huge opportunities. I think it's an opportunity to look at things different. And the best part about the entire conversation is when you go talk to the people, you talk to parents and you talk to kids, they are super excited about this. Because you know what, you hear so much from parents right now, particularly coming out of the pandemic is, hey, you know what, you know, we were watching what our kids were doing and we don't do, we don't need to, they don't need to know any of that. You know, we want them to have the exposure to the things that they're going to be doing in their jobs and the skills that they're going to need to, to be successful. So I think it's a huge opportunity for all of us to come together, partner together to, 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 uh, to, to you know, make the changes and, and create the flexibility I think matters to families and kids. Thank you. And you teed up my my next question, actually, uh, around this this question of innovation. Um, obviously, launch, we have both the impact and innovation cohort. So it's an interesting initiative in that it's focused on system sustainability and acceleration, but also this idea of, you know, pushing the envelope a bit and maybe rethinking some of the systems, some of the, the silos, frankly, in, in many states. And um, our relationships across those 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 levels and systems as well. Um, so I think we all agree that innovation is needed to rethink programs and opportunities for learners together. Um, where do you see the greatest opportunities for innovation? Where do you feel like uh, in Rhode Island, Governor, um, that that you feel like you can really push the envelope? I know you mentioned a, a great new initiative uh, that is really seeking to kind of rethink how people experience uh, school altogether. Yes, Quinn, and, and and thank you, Speaker, for your comments. Please tell, tell the governor I said hello next time you run into him, all right? Uh, and uh, I knew him as a lieutenant governor, now as governor as well. But I think the, the, the greatest opportunities are in um, uh, expanding the what we consider the learning time, right? So right now in, in Rhode Island, we're, the learning experience is 180 days. Uh, we spend most of our time in that area, and as I mentioned at the top of my uh, um, my comments with uh, our commissioner Infante Green, uh, we are very supportive of that. Um, but I think that there's an area uh, that is far exceeds that space. Um, we're setting up a nonprofit in our in our state that is going to initially add a million hours of new learning time a year outside the 180 day school block, uh, working with municipal leaders, uh, and business leaders, as uh, the speaker mentioned, uh, I think that they need to get a lot more engaged. Uh, but the opportunity is really in the space that the kids are not in school, ironically, right? We need to do the best we can when they're in school. Uh, but I'll give you an example. This weekend, I attended one of our high schools, and there was a major robotics program going on. It was a New England competition. You had hundreds of kids from Rhode Island. They were up early on a Sunday morning participating on work that, quite frankly, I couldn't do uh, in terms of the high-tech uh, nature of it. Um, and I talked to them and I and I visited, uh, they had the, you know, it was like almost an Indy 500 where they had the competition in the gym and then in another gym they had the, you know, you would you would head into the uh, the areas where they did the mechanical work, uh, you know, during, uh, after, you know, during the race. So I think that identifying things that are already going on that are, consistent with the mission of what the launch is doing, uh, putting that under a statewide effort, uh, including municipal leaders to get outside the 180 day learning timeframe, uh, get it into 365 and actually build the culture of exactly what you're trying to do here uh, and with the launch of uh, really building a culture that supports the idea of career paths uh, on, a, on a, day, uh, a daily basis in, in the communities mayors can actually do that they can connect with every family because it's not just about public schools 
in my opinion, it's about every kid, whether in a parochial school, a public school, a private school, a charter school, a mayoral academy, if they're homeschooled or they actually live in our state and they live out and they, and they attend schools outside the state in that K through 12 area. So I think the major opportunity for us, I'll just speak for us in Rhode Island, is to move it from 180 day learning experience intentionally into a 365 day learning experience, taking that like that robotic program, identifying where the work is already being done and then add to that work. Great, thank you. And Speaker Houston, um, I know you mentioned a lot of the, the, the challenges and as opportunities as well. And where does innovation fit in uh, the state of Indiana's plans going forward? Well, it's a huge portion of it. And, and, but I think we have to talk about innovation to be honest with this, fellas. Innovation also means failure, right? Not everything you do and not everything that we accomplish is going to be perfect. And as I try to remind people, as we talk about things, look, the, the existing system in Indiana, we've seen about 10% decline in our college going rate. At the same point between 18 and 22 year old males, we're seeing a 10% decline in our, in our uh, workforce participation rate. So guess what? The existing system isn't doing a great job anyway. So as we change, there will be things that we don't get right. There will be missed opportunities and there will be things we learn from. You can't let failure stop innovation. And we've talked a lot about that. Um, I'll tell you where I think innovation is. We've got some employers in our state that are, are already started schools in their, in their, um, in their school, in, in their um, uh, offices where their kids are doing coursework in the morning, doing, you know, apprenticeship type work in the afternoon. They're getting credit, you know, across the entire day. We allow the money to follow the kid um, into, into those types of scenarios. We're creating accounts or giving kids flexibility because they, they have to deal with issues like transportation or, hey, heck, how am I going to buy some boots for, for you know, my apprenticeship work, it, it, you know, depending on the type of of, of job I'm going to do or the tools I'm going to need. And so we're trying to create flexibility for that. Um, you know, it, it, and I think the other thing that I'd say about innovation, it's interesting the governor mentioned robotics. I was with Toyota uh, yesterday, tremendous partner of ours, awesome in the space, terrific uh, partner in, in, in working in pathways and, and, and supporting young kids and students. But they, they were at a robotics competition, and, and he was telling me that, you know, the, the, the bunch of those kids, they're not going the traditional four-year path to college. They're going to go to work go get their associate's degree on, in the pathway. They're going to get a stackable certification. They're going to get their associate's degree and go to the bachelor's degree. These kids are extraordinarily talented. And, the, and they want, and the way that they're going to enter into post-secondary is different than, but frankly, you know, I entered in the post-secondary, probably many of these people on the call are entering post-secondary. We've got to create pathways for them to do that. And a lot of that's going to be through an employer-led system, as Matt noted in his preview. Look, there's there's concerns about cost of colleges and, ex, and debt and the return on investment that, that families are seeing. This this pathway that, that we're organizing with your partnership, I think, begins to eliminate some of those hurdles that, that cause the, 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 the barriers that, that feel like they're too much for a kid to overcome. And, um, you know, it has to be aligned. We've got great partnerships with our higher ed. Um, uh, you know, commission. They've Chris Lowry has been an outstanding partner in all this, but it means change. I mean, and and we should never forget that innovation. You know, the, the failure is part of innovation, and and you got to learn from it and accept it, and and then and then improve based upon it. That's great. You brought up kind of an important point here is the resources that are available for learners and pathways. And I'm curious, uh, Governor and Speaker, how are you marshaling resources? And those can be monetary, they can be other supports, it could be policies and programs, but how are you marshaling uh, resources to really support the development and sustainability of high quality pathways? Governor? So I think on the top level, it's the communication. Uh, I meet weekly with the, with our speaker and our Senate president. Uh, they they have a, everything to do with the budget that finally gets approved. I think budgets are really important. We've got dollars in right now uh, for a, a strategy where we can complete associate degrees or certificate degrees or four-year degrees. Uh, and so I, we're gonna need a General Assembly of support to do that. We've also using our community college to provide pathways into where we're gonna be uh, focused on an offshore wind. We're gonna be able to be offshore, we're the ocean state. So 
we're putting dollars in right now where we have a significant uh, part of our population that are language challenged. Uh, so we put money in the budget this year into the education budget so that we can accelerate uh, the learning of the English language and, and really celebrate the dual language strategy that I think is gonna be important to Rhode Island and to over our overall economy. We invest in our CTE operations and take a, a real uh, personal interest in what that board is doing, who's, who's on that board, how they're interacting in a positive way with our Department of Education. So it's it's using not only the some of the federal dollars that we have put into school construction. So I mean, we need you need facilities. We for us, we put a you know we got a bond pass. Plus, I put an additional fifty million dollars of our surplus in a small state like that. There's a sizable number for school construction, and we're looking at what that school construction will look like in advance, so that we know that we're meeting uh, the skill sets that are, are down the line, that are decades down the line. So. I think the intentional investment, uh, taking advantage of certain federal dollars that have been in place, uh, and then we start to really invest in our higher ed uh, in a way where, whether it's um, a college promise that I extended permanently that creates a pathway at no cost to students that need last dollars in. We're currently uh, proposing the same thing for juniors and seniors at our Rhode Island College that has primarily been a nurse and, and teacher uh, school, but now we're gonna advance that into areas where higher ed, higher incomes could be realized through a cyber technology program that I think is, will be announced in the next few months to create a new major there. And then we have all, our your University of Rhode Island, again, this is specific to Rhode Island, everybody has a different route, but we, we put a bond on to improve the Bay Campus, which is right on the water, that got approved. We put additional money in to invest in the uh, blue and the and the green economy, which our University of Rhode Island is one of the leading research universities in the country relative to that. So I think you go, you're investing where your strengths are, that are forward thinking, uh, making sure that you're making those investments in your current structures to get the out outcome that you're looking for. Uh, but it also, again, I keep on reemphasizing, and I repeat that because I know there's a lot of innovators on this call and really love to share what our thinking is about moving from that 180 day learning experience to a 365 day learning experience and how that includes all your university presidents, public and private, it includes anybody that includes your C, uh, you know, CTE boards, it includes your, your, your unions, the NEA, the AFT, bringing them in, into, a bay, into a, in a, an area that uh, they all can kind of agree about exactly what you're talking about here, that pathways are important, Professionals want to get those pathways in place uh, so that the young people that we're working with or even young adults, right, with, with finishing uh, degrees, right? We're, we're looking at, I was at a community college and I'll just finish up, but I was at a community college with age groups that ran from 20 to 55 that were re-entering programs that we have set up to recertify and to, and to actually increase their um, marketability in the job market because they're increasing their skills. So I don't think there's really an age group that pathways uh, that you should discriminate against because I think in the end, our goal in Rhode Island, like I said, is improve academic outcomes, improve incomes for families and making people healthier so they can actually enjoy living in this great country that we live in. So that that would be my overview at that point in time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, speaker, I, I think the governor makes a great point in, in you know reminding us all that you know learners uh, aren't just you know navigating one system; they're navigating multiple systems. And those resources sometimes are siloed. But I'd love to hear how Indiana is kind of marshalling its resources. And again, those can be financial and otherwise to kind of support um, pathways uh, and and learners along that journey. Well, Quinn, there's no doubt that, that, frankly, funding and the silos is probably one of the biggest barriers to this work. And it's tough because you, you know, you, you're uh, you're making people feel uncomfortable because you're not funding things the way you've always funded them. You're putting priorities in place, and and so you know, for us, it's very important that we include it in our standard uh, funding formula. I don't want it sitting outside of it. I don't want this to feel like an add-on. I want this to be something that every one of our schools and every one of our parents, every one of our kids knows is extraordinarily important to us. It should be valued. It should be measured. I, I believe with, you know, Governor Bush has got, you know, says a line all the time, what gets measured gets done. 
this is easy to measure, right? We can very clearly see the, the outcomes on certifications and, and credentials and, and associate's degrees. Um, you know, and, and I think we're what we're trying to do is align those things to make sure that this isn't like, you know, for some kids or this is an add on or this is just CTE. This is for every kid. I mean, this is for every single kid. You know, I, I don't go into a community uh, that, that, that doesn't talk about this, you know, about, you know, how what, what skills are my kids going to get that they can have high wage, high demand jobs. They don't use those terms. They say, how do I get a good job? Uh, we use these those terms, but but you know I think that's the key in it, and I think you know one of the things I think as policymakers we get wrong a lot is is that we we say boy this is really important to us, but we want to do it on the margins or we want to add you know a little here a little there, and what, what I just feel compelled like if we believe this is important and we believe that pathways are extraordinarily important for every kid in the state, let's build our funding mechanisms to support it. Let's make sure that money can follow the kid where the kid needs the services that are being offered. Not, not you know, I think the other challenge in all this has been, you know, well, the government's going to figure out what the private sector wants. I, it doesn't work. It has to be employer led and the money has to go to where the kid's going to receive the services and the services they need. It should be measured. You should hold people accountable and you should adjust accordingly because the economy's not going to change. I mean, the economy's never going to stay static. So you have to be flexible. Your, your systems have to be flexible to adjust to what the economy needs, not on what people like me might think. Well, I think both of you have hit upon the, and, and just, you know, really embody the urgency of this work, I think, in, 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 in both of the, uh, the sets of initiatives that you're, you're, you're working on. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. But I would like to pose one last question to, to both of you. And this is in many ways a unique moment, a, an inflection point for our country and pathways is obviously at the top of the list of a lot of conversations around how to address whether it's learning loss or whether uh, economic and job market uh, tribulations. And I, I just wanna ask, what do you believe is most important that we get right at this moment in time to leverage the opportunities and investments in pathways. Governor. I think that I agree with the speaker that accountability is, is the is the absolute most important thing in measurement. And so I again I'll only speak to what we're ready to do in Rhode Island and certainly take input from around the country and, and share anything that people think that what we're talking about is worth listening to. But it's accountability, but it's not just accountability in the schools. You know, we need to we need to spread that accountability out. So we're investing. When you talk about federal dollars, I got the General Assembly, General Assembly approved a substantial amount of dollars that we're going to partner in with municipalities, who partner in with schools, who partner in with uh, local nonprofits, who partner in with local universities and the business community, and the, and bring the families and the and the students and the and the and the and the parents into the mix. But I want to be able to set up a system that holds the nonprofit as accountable as I do the schools. So when we can measure reading and math outcomes, because we do a similar test that Massachusetts does, and we know that we trail them by double digits at the moment, we can measure that on an annual basis. We've set a goal to meet that level on a before 2030 in Rhode Island, but we can hold, uh, for instance, in Newport right now, Newport, which everybody knows Newport, there'll be music in Newport this summer, by the way, come and visit. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that we can hold the municipal leader accountable if we're going to invest dollars in those in, in, you know, in, in, um, in facility or programming. We can hold the Boys and Girls Club as accountable as we can. The, uh, we can hold them as accountable for the outcomes for the kids that they're working with. So I'm with the speaker on this one. I think you need to actually set up systems where you can hold a broad base of individuals who want to see progress in this hour area and, and improvement and pathways I think you need to really build in that accountability piece. Speaker Houston, 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say, you know, employer led. And, and the fact of the matter is that, you know, we're not going to build a systems. We're not, you know, I, I've been around government long enough to know I have great appreciation for the tremendous people and in, in government and in education. But the fact of the matter is we're, we're going to be slow to develop systems. They're going to meet these kids needs. Uh, we got to we got to remove barriers, get out of the way, be be a measurement and adapt. 
But the, the, I just I think the sense of urgency on this is critical. And, and, and again, I think sometimes the people that don't feel the urgency uh, are the people in the system. Uh, because people outside the system, whether it's the, the, the employers, the families, they feel it right now. And uh, we, we have to be prepared to act quickly. Great. We'll have to leave it at that. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, I, we are both at the launch, uh, as, as launch partners, are big fans of the work that Rhode Island and Indiana does and continues to push forward, and we'll be watching. Uh, now I'd like to, to, to pass things off to my launch colleague, Kyle Hartung. He's Associate Vice President at Jobs for the Future, who will provide some brief remarks and help us transition to the next panel. As Quentin mentioned, uh, I have the privilege to support the education practice at Jobs for the Future. Uh, we're for nearly 40 years. We've been driving transformation of the American workforce and education systems with a focus on equitable economic advancement. Um, a huge thank you to uh, Governor McKee and Speaker Houston for lending your voices and your insights to this public conversation about the current state and the future state of the Pathways work. Um, and especially those last points you both drove home about a broader vision for accountability in terms of to whom should we be accountable and who can be a, a broader participant in that conversation. As I'm reflecting on um, some of the comments that you made, um, I've tried to organize into three broad themes that I heard. And one of them uh, is a commitment I heard ring out really loudly and clearly uh, about bringing a vision for high quality and equitable education for career pathways um, systems by removing policy barriers, by establishing conditions and committing resources that allow for new types of partnerships and ultimately collaboration across these traditional silos in K-12 education, post-secondary education, and the workforce. Um, and why do I hear you? Uh, what seems critical about this in your remarks is that this is going gonna, is gonna to be what it will allow young people and young adults. And I heard even the adults who need this access by design to the academic, the technical, and ultimately the work-based experiences that they will need to be able to really live into and shape their best possible futures. Um, another theme that really resonated with me as I listened to the speaker's remarks today is the intentionality that they are bringing to the design and the execution of their strategies for pathways that um, in my opinion, are leveraging um, executive and legislative leadership to signal um, to, to others what is important and why, but that on the other side is also activating the important work of storytelling and story co-creation about the promise of pathways that includes and elevates the voices and lived experience of youth and their families and communities and really centers their needs in this conversation. And a third thing that really rung out for me um, uh, and I really appreciated hearing was your forward thinkingness um, uh, in these remarks about a willingness to be bold and a commitment to being bold. And we need to be able to test new ideas and innovations. And I even heard out uh, in this comment about willing to fail um, in the name of ensuring that we don't miss a really good opportunity uh, to design or possibly redesign our current strategies and systems in a way that will truly work for individuals, for communities, for employers, and ultimately for economies. So with these reflections in mind, uh, I would like to transition us to the next segment of our event, where we will hear additional perspectives from leaders of state teams and launches impact and innovation cohorts in a panel moderated by one of my colleagues in this initiative, uh, Kate Kramer. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you're able to join us today and share in the enthusiasm that we all have about this new initiative. Um, as Kyle mentioned, I'm Kate Kramer, the Deputy Executive Director at Advanced CTE, one of the five national partners in the launch initiative. For those not familiar with Advanced CTE, we represent state leaders across the country who oversee career technical education in all 50 states, DC, and the US territories, and are thrilled to be here today um, to speak with three amazing leaders from incredibly strong, innovative states to hear about the work they're doing, to hear similarly the conversation we just heard, where we need to lean in, where there's greater opportunity, um, and how we can really move this forward to create the greatest opportunity for each and every learner. So I'd love to open it up with a brag question. I'd love to hear from each of you, what are you proudest of um, that's happening in your state or your communities with regards to college and career pathways? 
Or another way is what do you most want the thousand plus people listening through this webinar and in the future um, to know about your state and the progress you have made? So why don't we start with Dr. Thompson? Thank you and appreciate the opportunity to brag a little bit about Kentucky. Uh, one of the things that there's a lot of things I'm proud of, but one of the things I'm the most proud of, we've stopped pointing fingers. And I heard the uh, earlier panelists talking about has to be workforce led. My argument is that it has to be led by all of us. So our Commonwealth education continuum is truly not the regular P16 or P20 council. It really has experts, policymakers, employers, higher ed, K-12 leaders, as well as those that are in the trenches coming together, identifying processes, paths, and practices to look at exactly how we can build a continuum all the way from early childhood until the work into the workforce. Now, all of us have input into that. You know, it's not just me telling K-12 what they need to do as the head of higher ed, nor is it about employers saying, well, give us this, you're giving us this, but you're not giving us this. We're saying, what does it take to fulfill those needs that we have that betters Kentucky? And we do identify potholes, pathways, processes, policies. And so we work hard to do that. And that Commonwealth Education Continuum is chaired by myself, uh, our Commissioner of Education, K-12, and also the Lieutenant Governor. And it's designed to do exactly those items that many P-16 councils and P-20 councils in the past have talked about, but it's designed to actually do that work. So that's, I've got a lot of things I'm proud about, but that those partnerships, I am the most proud. That's great. Well, we'll have plenty of chances for you to come and brag about more things. No, no worries. Um, Commissioner Schwinn, I'd love to hear from you next. Absolutely. And I think we're doing some really exciting things in Tennessee. Um, you know, we've had a long history over, you know, 12 years of, I think, really innovating and leading in the CTE space in particular. But of recent note, um, I'm incredibly excited about a half a billion dollar investment. It's the single largest one time investment ever in the state of Tennessee, specific to innovative school models and expanding CTE programs of study for all students. I think Governor Lee and General Assembly really wanted to make sure that high school and middle school look different. Um, um, eight years from now that we don't have the same types of experiences that we did 10, 20 years ago, but we're actually expanding what those um, opportunities and programs of study can be for all students. I also think that Tennessee is really leading the nation in a lot of areas related to apprenticeships. We've more than doubled work-based learning um, during COVID. Um, in the state, which we're incredibly excited about, we've increased the number of students who have received industry certifications, even through a pandemic and became the first state to have the for, uh, teaching as an apprenticeable profession. Um, and so that was really exciting for us in terms of really kind of um, narrowing and limiting the number of vacancies, permits and waivers that we have in the state. And then I think the last thing is just, we've got a new $5.6 billion Ford campus that's gonna be built in West Tennessee. It's gonna create 6,000 new jobs. Um, and when we think about bringing industry and bringing labor uh, opportunities into the state of Tennessee, really having K-12 be that funnel um, where we can actually create programs that attract businesses into the state. And I think we've done a really great job of that with our schools and districts who have been leading this work. That's great. And we're going to touch on a lot of the innovation you talked about, the collaboration you talked about. So I think a lot that we'll come back to. Um, and finally, Dr. Lovett, love to hear from you more at the local level. Uh, thank you, Kate. And for uh, for Texas, we're really excited about first that there is a policy framework that really supports a pathways uh, option for Texas, that being there are bonus funds for school districts uh, to make sure students are career and college ready. Um, and those bonus funds give a lot of incentive to high schools to, to innovate and actually advance programming that's going to get students more connected to that through line for a pathway. On the other end of the spectrum, there are policies already in place based around work-based learning and incentives for that to make that happen as well so employers can engage and we can be mindful that it's not career or college, but it's career and college. Um, and so what we're really excited about in Texas right now is the Community College Finance Commission's recommendations um, that uh, right now are being discussed, which is uh, House Bill 8. Um, what that does for Texas is for our community colleges, it puts, uh, it changes the way in which funding happens where it's not enrollment-based uh, but outcomes-based, 
But more importantly, the focus is around workforce development and also the focus is around uh, supporting or recognizing all the great work that happens through dual credit, whether it's early college high schools or PTECs. Um, and so with that being in play, I think uh, what you heard from the speaker and from the governor is that when you can put the policy conditions in place, you know, local uh, communities, regions can all start, start to work on strategies that are going to help expand and improve pathways for the students that they serve. Um, and it's important to note, and I think uh, for Texas is true for Kentucky and Tennessee, um, you know, we're the reason why pathways are so important is we're not making assumptions that successful programs can lead to successful systems because sometimes there's a disconnect. We're not also making we're also not making the assumption that outputs lead to outcomes. We can all hit our numbers and claim success, but is it really getting and driving the numbers that we need to see to make sure that everyone is successful in our state? So love the comments from the governor and speaker as well as uh, from the panelists here on on this session. Thank you. What I love about all of your responses is that they're really systemic. Like none of you mentioned, we have this program, we have this one off, but talking about funding, accountability, collaboration, governance, right? These are the foundational pieces and frankly, why all three of your states are involved in this initiative, right? That really those, as, as Dr. Levitt said, those kind of those foundational kind of play, pieces in place, right? That you can build, build from uh, the, the building blocks. Um, so something that came up a lot in some of your com your comments now, but also certainly from the governor and the speaker earlier was about this need for shared shared collaboration and shared commitment across sectors, certainly K-12 and post-secondary, but also of course workforce private sector. So Commissioner Schwann, I'd love to talk to hear from you first about how Tennessee is fostering this type of cross-sector collaboration and what lessons you've learned along the way. Absolutely. And I think the, the launch opportunity actually helps us to strengthen that even more. And so our pathways have been made possible because we have such incredible alignment between local, state, and district partners. Um, and that's exemplified by the number of diverse funding streams that support the work. We in, integrate with Department of Labor. We just signed an MOU with them for some of our apprenticeship work. We have really partnered with um, our colleges and universities in terms of dual credit opportunities, et cetera. But I think through this opportunity, we've been able to take a number of folks. So that's not just the Department of Labor, um, higher education, our school district leaders, but also community partners who've been able to come in and understand that this is a joint effort. And one of the things that our superintendents have said, um, who've been participating in this effort in particular, have really articulated that seeing the connection between labor and workforce and K-12 and this being an economic driver has been critical in their lens and how they then approach the work. And so I think one of the things that's made Tennessee's programs of study so strong that we're seeing academic achievement, whether you're on CTE program of study or not, ACT performance is the same. We're seeing that there are different ways for students to move through um, their various pathways in order to get to the career of their choosing a lot faster is because we've got community supports on the ground helping districts to create and foster the opportunities in collaboration with the post-secondary space to move students through faster um, than ever before. So it's been exciting to see just that net get a lot broader and frankly see more of the state agencies work in closer collaboration so that our local communities and partners are able to accelerate the work much, much faster than they have. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Thompson, I mean, you you kind of spoke, I think you spoke to how you're fostering the collaboration through your, your continuum, but love to hear about the lessons learned, what some of the challenges and, and how you've been able to kind of move forward and continue to drive, drive your system forward. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me be clear in answering that question to point out the premise by which we operate. We believe that for Kentucky to be a powerful, economic, sustainable, thriving state, you have to have a highly educated workforce. To do that, you have to have a strong higher ed system. And to do that, you have to have a strong P-12 system. So I, I take this as it's about career. And 90% of the jobs that we are creating in Kentucky, whether it's our largest Ford battery plant or any of the others, will require a post-secondary credential of some sort. And to look at it from that aspect, what it means is there are community colleges, technical colleges, and our four-year institutions are all workforce systems, getting them there. And to do that, we're going to have to work with K-12 in alignment, not just with dual credit, having dual credit, having an affordable statement to make, but it's making sure that we're aligned, that they have the information they have, like what we're doing with Gear Up and other folks, in the seventh, eighth grade, 
to start thinking about decisions where they need to go and how they need to get there and how they need to perform. It's a partnership. But we also have to have our workforce on the front end. You know, one of the, I know you all have seen this, that my goal is to have at least 100% of people either in high school or college with a work-based learning experience. It's a student success statement, as well as helping them to understand that they can be in sustainable, thriving employment and we do this around quality and equity. We can't leave anybody behind, no matter what geographic region or what income or what race or ethnicity that they belong to. So the idea that such as we've done with our healthcare collaborative workforce, we got 10 million last year as an example, as a pilot from the legislature, we invested that. We have 49 healthcare partners who are putting in multiple times that to build our workforce. And we just got a bill passed, so well, it will go to the floor, we hope it passes. Today, now to create that public-private partnership in the long run. We've shown that this works. It's a return on investment that's greater than anything we've seen. We've shown that partnerships without pointing fingers and without taking this, what I call exclusive elitist role about what we are, we can do it all ourselves, that doesn't get us where, where we need to go. Now I'm going to run out of time. There's a whole lot more examples that I can give you. But the biggest statement that I can make is really creating the kind of dialogue process and interactions that it takes to have all of us toward that target of creating a strong Kentucky. Thank you. Um, and I think that that dialogue, that process and the shared values, the shared commitment, right? That's really that you're coming together. And I think that finger pointing is, is always a challenge when you're trying to bring, and I'm so glad you brought in the middle grades as well and really moving into some of those earliest, which creates more complications, but has to be part of the broader system. So I, you brought in a lot about also, I thank you for addressing bringing in workforce and other kind of partners that, that's been we've been hearing throughout the day. Dr. Lovett, I'd love to go to you because increasingly part of any collective impact model around career pathways requires some non-governmental intermediary to help coordinate, and in some cases even put pressure on that public sector. So someone who actually used to work at a state agency in one of the states represented on today's uh, panel, um, but now is, has made a shift to that third party organization in, in Texas. I'd love to hear your perspective on the role and responsibilities of intermediaries as we really elevate and accelerate uh, pathways. Sure, and, and we all know now that uh, the public-private partnership framework you know, is the cornerstone of any successful pathways strategy or design. Um, you have to have an individual or an organization um, that's not necessarily the implementer, but uh, the connector to make sure that all the assets within a region come to bear. Uh, Want to give a, a shout out and kudos to Commissioner Swin during my time at the Tennessee Department of Labor and Workforce Development um, and partnering with us. And um, it was good to be in the early conversations of the concept of a teacher apprenticeship, which is now uh, played out really well and in inspiring work even in Texas from that partnership. But back to the intermedi intermediary conversation, um, you know, when I managed a group of regional directors and apprenticeship intermediaries at the state level, uh, I literally had to retrain them to be more entrepreneurial, um, to understand that if you lean heavily on K through 12 uh, or, or in higher ed or even in employers, you're missing the point. You know, your role is to bring all these partners in together and let them figure out how they want to build that solution and then help them figure out how they're going to measure success. But more importantly, how are they going to uh, make sure that they can sustain these efforts through public and private funding? Um, so intermediaries are a critical part of Pathways Design. And I would say, honestly, we need more resource to build up more intermediaries. Um, it's interesting during my time, uh, even in Tennessee and in Texas, you know, sometimes they're informal individuals that really care about their region, and they're the ones that are making the meetings happen and bring pe bringing people together and figuring out the solutions. Other times, if they're trained up well, or they have the resources, you know, you can find public, even private entities that can serve in that role. But we do need more resourcing around it, because if we're talking about pathways design and path, you know, and, and pipelines, uh, we have to make sure that we have individuals that get at the heart of what's true, what's common across all of the different assets in a region and figuring out how to guide them in a, in a non-prescriptive way to creating those solutions. I think most communities welcome that. Um, it does, you know, each community is totally different in how they connect with those different resources or that intermediary. But I, I do know once you have a successful intermediary in your region, 
um, we can think about all the different communities across the nation that have been really successful in bringing everyone to the table to make things happen for our students. I love that. I mean, I can't imagine at this day and age, there are many districts, institutions, state agencies that are not looking for more capacity and help, right, in connecting these dots, given all the district systems and just how much, um, how much is on our plate and how much the challenge and the opportunity ahead of us. Um, so I want to open this question up to, to all of you. And this is actually something that Dr. Thompson um, very eloquently set up, right, which is about when designing and learning pathways, quality and equity need to be constantly balanced and attended to. So we've definitely seen states that have incredibly robust labor market aligned pathways, but don't necessarily have the students entering those or don't have representation, right, of students entering those that, that reflects their broader communities. And so we can't really succeed if we're not actually creating those access and those opportunities for success. So I'd love to hear in each of your states, which, which of the students or learners are have those biggest barriers or hurdles as, doc, as uh, the governor earlier mentioned? And how are you designing pathways and supports with them in mind to make sure that truly these are, are open to all learners, even those who might have the greatest barriers to participation and success. So I'm gonna start with Commissioner Ashwin on that. Sure, and I think there's so many different ways to think about this. So certainly in Tennessee, one of the things that we think about is really kind of urban, suburban, and rural. Um, the transportation gap for many of our students is really significant and the cost to districts are, are astronomical in some cases. And so we think about that. We also think about the difference in, in kind of gender, which students are going into which programs of study. We think about income, um, making sure that regardless of the zip code that you're in, that you have opportunities to enter the program of study that is most aligned to your interests in terms of future workforce. And so there's a couple things that we're doing to address that. I think first is this half billion dollar innovative school models grant. Um, essentially every high school in the state gets a million dollars, every middle school gets half a million dollars and our mixed model schools get half a million dollars to reimagine time, space and modality of the traditional school experience. And so we started with just a very small number, um, just about 20 to 24 pilot grants to see how this program could work. And just with those 20 to 24 programs in the first two years, we saw over 2,100 students enrolling in over 117 courses, over almost 2,500 industry credentials were earned. Um, and that was in partnership with over 150 organizations statewide. And so you think about just that redesign process in just two years, what that did for access and opportunity. Kids are getting pilot license, building planes and flying them, taking high school courses on industry work sites. And it's a completely different way of getting students at all levels at risk all the way through current higher performers to be engaged and excited about the, the careers that they will eventually move into. But the second example I wanna use in Tennessee is AP Access for All. What we found is that there was a real gap between the rigor of courses and the access and opportunity for students to have post-secondary credits if they didn't have a TCAT or a community college nearby, if there wasn't an opportunity to go onto a post-secondary campus to earn those. And so with AP Access for All, we partnered with the Nice Wonger Foundation and we've been able to now offer 14 online AP courses taught by certified Tennessee teachers to any student in the state, no matter where you live. And that has 142% increase in access in Northwest Tennessee, a 71 or, uh, in South Central, 71% increase when you're looking at Northwest, but essentially almost 95% of our districts are participating. We have higher pass rates in those courses than we have in any of the other, uh, than kind of a traditional program because our rural students in Northwest Tennessee who can't, their district just can't afford to have a full-time AP calculus teacher, those kids now have access to AP calculus or an AP science course, AP English. And that's just one example. We can broaden that across all of our CTE programs of study. And we're seeing our districts do that through more of a mixed model and these innovative opportunities. So no matter where you live, you can go to workforce, you can learn, you know, do high school credits on workforce. You're able to then get access to work-based learning and you can get those rigor post-secondary credits that are absolutely necessary in order to get a jump start like everybody else. Right, I mean, I, I definitely think the geographic barrier is a real one for access. And so it sounds like there's some, some creative uh, and keep our eye and see what happens as this really money hits the ground and innovation takes off. Um, why don't we go to Dr. Thompson next um, and love to hear kind of who some of the hardest to reach students are and, and what you're doing to make sure they've got access and supports. Let me be clear, if you don't know you have opportunities, you really don't have it. I could list, we have a great data system in Kentucky, KY stats, you know about it. We've got data from any place you want to look at it. Great analytics, but I only look at analytics if it really can tell me exactly where I need to go 
to create policies and practices that allows me to get where we need to go. And so what we found out is we expanded our dual credit. We even have free community college in the five big sector areas, which covers a lot. So it looked as if we had opportunity and access, but you look at our data, our kids from Eastern Kentucky, Appalachia, where I'm from, our black kids that look like me, they were not going in it. Now, in aggregate, we, we will provide you 12 uh, dual credit courses free. We'll do a lot for you. It looks like you have access, but if you don't have people going into it, based on where they're from, then we argue whether or not you have opportunities. So we look at it from that standpoint. For an example, we also did data on all our kids that had uh, dual credit courses and AP courses and how well did they do in college uh, once they got there. And we found out if you're a black kid, you actually, if you had access to this, you did better than the cohorts that were in better privileged roles. So the what we are saying clearly then, we are working with P12 as our advanced Kentucky has done with, uh, with AP to, to show that if we can build a better pipeline that's very focused, very targeted on those that are not included, we're gonna have a bigger output. And I'm proud to say that Kentucky, we're closing gaps in higher ed, it's faster, faster than other states because we've been focused on all of those that haven't been well served while at the same time raising a bar for everybody. So the gap is being closed by everybody going up and not by keeping someone steady. So the argument is not to have suffered uh, loss of those that have historically done well, but it's also making sure that we're not losing those that haven't had access or opportunity. So we're, we're focused heavily in that way we'll have a new dual credit policy we already have one that's pretty good that's coming out soon that's going to focus really heavily on equity and quality because we got a lot better data than we've ever had to be able to help us to make those prescriptive policies based on the analytics that we have so three quick things that i'll say that this is about intentionality it's not just about broad doing every, we need to do as much as we can to offer access, but it also is about creating something that allows them to think that they can do okay. Many of our students, where they're from, based on geography, based on income, based on race, ethnicity, believe that they don't belong there, thus they don't get there. And many teachers, honestly, that not help them to get there based on that. So one, intentionality in building that pipeline. Number two, is truly being able to, that once we get them in that pipeline, that we're not a barrier when they get to college. We got rid of every developmental ed course for zero credit hours, but we built wraparound services for all those kids coming in from P12 and adult learners to get the help that they need. Number three is that we don't look at that then as our job well done. We have to also see if they're in align, alignment with the talent that our workforce needs, because that's very much a part of seeing relevance in the work, that they are aligned with the best path to allow them to afford to get there. And, and number three, that really they see the quality that's included. If it's a dual credit course, an AP course, it's a college course. It's not just a high school course, so it should be of college rigor. But they all should have that wraparound service that they need in order to do that rigor. And there's a lot more to say about that, obviously, but that's how we are approaching that in Kentucky. That's great. And I love coming back to the central question of it's got about balance, quality, and equity have to be equally balanced and attended to at all times. Can't sacrifice one for the other. Um, so Dr. Lovett, love to hear your perspective on, on that balancing and, and what this is looking like in Texas. Sure. I mean, one uh, uh, a group that has uh, barriers that really were exacerbated during COVID-19 would be you know, single mothers. Um, and when you think about the imp impact on the workforce, uh, their ability to enroll, um, and also what options and opportunities are available to them, um, it's, it's one group that I'd love to lift up um, as a, a population that if we can solve for that, we could probably solve for other issues in the system. What we did in San Antonio, the city of San Antonio, um, as sort of an intermediary for uh, our workforce partners there, we took them through a journey mapping exercise to solve for single mothers. And essentially, this was higher ed, workforce development, employers, local government, uh, K through 12, 
uh, to look on a board and just lay out the programs that are available for a successful pathway to, to a career and a promising career. Um, what we noticed once everyone laid it all out was, you know, you can name these programs and you assume that they can apply for that population. But when you specifically solve for a single mother and to get even more in detail to solve for it for certain industries like advanced manufacturing or healthcare or IT, all of the programs in this post-its on the board really didn't apply specifically to single mothers. And so what we noticed was there were, there were significant gaps um, across that continuum in the pipeline where uh, what the group is working on now is um, uh, an approach to collaborative advising that includes high school counselors, college advisors, uh, private advisor, private sector advisors, nonprofits in the communities, and most importantly, uh, employers even as advisors as well, um, so that they can help with transitional advising from one system to the next system. Um, and so I think it's important to note that uh, what's been stated today, and it's something that I, I always sort of preach, is that we built um, you know, linear models for nonlinear realities. And so when we looked at that journey mapping board, you know, the question really for everyone is, based on the model and the system you build, what type of student is ideal for getting through successfully? Is it the one with resources and supports? And they, you know, is that what it's built for? Or is it built for the barriers that we've just mentioned today? And if it's not, which one is the the, the larger share of the overall population that you need to be serving, my guess is it's probably not gonna be what you've designed it for because not that they will be okay, but we're seeing a large and larger number of students with barriers to success that, that we need to address. And so the best way I can look, think about it in a backwards way is you know what if we had for our postal service that they could deliver the mail as long as you had a mailbox on the side of the street that they could access straight from their from their Jeep, right? Not many people would get their mail across the nation, right? And so they found ways to connect in, in different ways. We have to build models like that as well for those with barriers. But I think when we start talking about pathways, um, I think it's important for us to always talk about or have specific conversations about those with barriers, because if we design these systems for someone who's gonna get it, have the supports and efficiently get through the system, you're probably only talking about 10 or 15% of your population, not the lion's share, which really needs the help and the support of a good pathways design. That's terrific. I love that. I love that specific example. And often when you're building those wraparound supports for single mothers, a lot of other people will benefit from them. Right? I think that's what's really important when you design on the margin for those with barriers. There's a lot of hidden barriers that may not be like two parent households may still have similar barriers, right? That'll benefit from those, those additional supports. I think that's such an important and, and great example. Well, we could keep going. I wish we could keep going. You all have so much expertise and enthusiasm and I'm sure there's so much more we could brag on, but we are pretty much at time. So thank you all so much. Um, thank you again to Governor McKee. Thank you to Speaker Houston. Thank you to Dr. President Thompson, Commissioner Schwinn, Dr. Lovett, really fantastic voices, perspectives. Um, and just expertise to bring to this conversation as we think about not just what, what we want to be true today, but we want to be true in the future. And that's really what this is all about. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, please stay involved. Um, We're so happy and excited that you wanted to be here today. You want to learn about this initiative, the work happening across these states, but the work is just beginning for launch. We literally launched a month ago. Um, and so please go to our website, launchpathways.org. You can sign up to stay involved. All of you who have joined this webinar or registered for it will have an opportunity to kind of sign up and, and stay in the loop. Um, and we look forward to the co continued learning, engagement, and opportunities for, for youth. So thank you all so much.